May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There was a man who had worked all of his life, had saved all of his money, and was a real miser when it came to his money. Just before he died, he said to his wife, When I die, I want you to take all my money and put it in the casket with me. I want to take my money to the afterlife with me. And so he got his wife to promise him with all of her heart that when he died, she would put all of the money into the casket with him. Well, he died. He was stretched out in the casket. His wife was sitting there in black and her friend was sitting next to her. And when they finished the ceremony, just before the undertaker got ready to close the casket, the wife said, wait, just a minute. She had a box with her. She came over with the box and put it into the casket. Then the undertakers locked the casket down and rolled it away. So her friend said, Girl, I know you weren't fool enough to put all that money in there with your husband. The loyal wife replied, Listen, I'm a Christian. I can't go back on my word. I promised him that I was going to put that money in the casket with him. You mean to tell me you put that money in the casket with him? I sure did, said the wife. I got it all together, put it into my account and wrote him a cheque. He can cash it if he can spend it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is one of the most well-known and beloved verses of scripture. It is John 3 verse 16 that we see displayed on television at sporting events, usually on a banner or a sign attached somewhere in a stadium. This is the verse that should be memorised, recited and be the subject of our meditation. We might reflect on the three parts of this verse. God's love, God's son and our belief. First, there is God's love. This world that God so loved is not some idealised place where people try to live in justice and peace. This world with all its crime, dishonesty, wars and constant feuding that divide people, with all its greed, immorality and pettiness, this world so loved by God that he wanted to bring healing a new life to it. The first reading from Numbers tells the Israelites grew impatient on the way <clears throat> and they spoke against God and against Moses. Snakes came among them and bit them. Moses prayed for them Lifting up a pole with a bronze snake on it, and they were healed. Israel's story is the story of every generation and really of every life. Still, God loved the world, the world we inhabit that he sent into it his son. In today's second reading, St Paul teaches us 
that the saving plan of God was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. St Mark's, its property and its people all collect together and the most important reality or ingredient in this place is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything else is secondary. Gardens, theology, we need to be first of all subscribed to the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and give him honour and glory. Jesus is the key. He's number one. Paul says, when we were dead in our transgressions, God brought us to life in Christ. Paul knew from that experience. He had persecuted the church. He was among her greatest persecutors, manical in his quest to arrest and imprison Christians. Then out of nowhere on the road to Damascus, the risen Christ appeared to him. With that, his life was changed. And Jesus is still powerful and potent and changing lives today, out of darkness into light. And, you know, this place is growing. It looks like we're shrinking at 7.30, but it doesn't matter. You know, they're all away somewhere else at the moment. And God is bringing people and he's changing us and he's taking us from one degree of glory to another. But we need to keep this precious Jesus Christ in the centre as number one. Paul had done nothing to deserve it, but salvation was now his in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the way to salvation, forgiveness and new life for the human race and for each of us. Jesus is the central key. God so loved this world that he sent his only son. <clears throat> Jesus Christ is the bridge between our sin and God's healing. In the gospel, Jesus refers to an incident in Numbers when poisonous stakes bit the people of Israel. They would have died, but Moses was told by God to fabricate a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and anyone who looked at that snake would be saved from death. Obedience to that command of God would neutralise the effect of the poison and they would be restored to life. The poison of sin infects our world and it infects us. We cannot, as hard as we might try, expel sin on our own. Something has to be powerful enough to pull it out of us to absorb it and to eliminate it. Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. On the cross, Jesus would be like that bronze serpent and bring healing to us. He would draw out the venom of sin in our life 
and replace it with the grace of new life. And finally, there is our belief. Lent is not a time, simply, to sympathise with the cross of Jesus, but to embrace it. That is, to begin once more to follow Jesus with our life. <clears throat> it's not the gazing, but the faithful following that brings healing and new life. We can sing about Jesus, meditate on Jesus, lament the sufferings of Jesus, celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, build wonderful churches to honour Jesus, but are we ready to follow Jesus? To open our lives to his teaching, his truth, his forgiveness as it comes to us through his church? Are we willing to take the steps of repentance to change how we live? We have been given a cure for the deep illness and rebellion of soul that we call sin. Left to itself, sin is toxic. For years my family have had cocker spaniels, usually two, but only one at the moment. And when you go walking, you know those things called cobbler's pigs? And they have nice um, fluffy hair and they come home and they shake and they've been walking in the bush and they shake cobbler's pegs into my garden, which I've spent hours pulling cobbler's pegs out of. And that, that is the most incredible um, weed to spread, you know, those little black things drop and then up they come and grow overnight. And sin is like that. Sin is fanciful and it's like a little cobbler's pig and it attaches to us and if we're not careful, um, it multiplies and it grows. Sin will kill us spiritually. But, dear ones, we have a cure in the cross of Jesus Christ. Will we put the cross on the wall or build a beautiful shrine around it or even wear it as jewellery? If we do only that, it won't do us any good unless we embrace Jesus and follow his teaching in our life. So reflect on a crucifix as we travel through Lent. Let it show you the absolute horror of sin. But it, let it also show you the gift of God's love and the curing forgiveness that can be ours if we follow Jesus. You know that old adage, God knows the worst about you, but he loves you all the same. We don't have to play games with God. We don't have to be religious. God knows us just as we are with our good bits and our other bits. And and he wants to give grace and mercy. He wants to set us free, to anoint us with his Holy Spirit, to cleanse us with his precious shed blood and, and, and just give us a wonderful day and a wonderful future. Whatever the burdens in your soul, that one verse is more than a phrase for a bumper sticker or a sign in a sports arena. It expresses the wonderful truth of what redemption is all about in this troubled world and for each of us whom God so loves and seeks to heal. For God 
so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let us pray. Father, I praise and thank you that out of the wood of the cross Jesus made a ladder to heaven, a coffin for our sins, and a throne which can receive our hearts. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.